Good evening, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a disjointed agenda from what you see behind me, uh, just because of people's time commitments. And uh, Lynn Sturman is going to be here, but he's not here yet. We usually start with public safety, and I know their time is valuable, but uh, Ms. Knight, the Albert Hill School Principal, is here, and we're going to we're going to start with her because she has a commitment at Fox Elementary for another school function at 6.30. So I'm going to get her. She has graciously hosted this uh, meeting for the three years that I've been on council. And we're so glad the brand new ceiling is here and the water damage was fixed. And so we're now back in the auditorium instead of the cafeteria. Uh, and that just goes to show you what what kind of challenges schools are facing, but she's just going to take a couple minutes and tell you about the great things that are happening at Albert Hill. So, uh, Lashante Knight, welcome. Her. Thank you. Thank you guys for being here today. Um, yeah, trust me, no applause is necessary. <laughs> <laughs> I am just happy to have you in our building and be able to host you, um, as I think it's always so important that the residents of our community are part of the school. And um, I think that's important not only to me, but in, in terms of our families and our children. So we are doing quite a bit here on the Hill as we like to describe it because we see this as a very special place. And me, I am a newcomer to the Richmond area and by that I mean I have not been here a full year and a half yet. And um, what I learned when I came here um, are all the wonderful things that happened in Hill before I came. So I am trying to continue with this tradition of excellence in this school. It's a beautiful building, architecturally stunning, and I want to make certain that the residents and the citizens of this community are very proud of what we are doing every day on behalf of their children, be it their own children, their neighbor's children, their grandchildren, or some loved one or another. And so we are very proud to service the students in this community and really from all over the city of Richmond because while we, are, we like to consider ourselves a neighborhood school, um, Richmond Public Schools does what's called open enrollment. So that means everyone has access to us at any given time during the open enrollment process. So we never know who's going to come through the door, but we service them at the highest level always. And so by doing that, uh, we've made some tremendous inroads um, over the course of the last year. So we took our school that used to be a very high performing place uh, many, many years ago, but through a number of variables from changes in leadership to teacher attrition to student changes and all types of things, uh, the school began to go on, a, a, unfortunately, um, a decline academically um, in, in many ways. We have aimed um, very hard to change the course, and we turned a corner last year within the course of one year. So now we have double-digit gains in all of our content areas. Our children are performing um, pretty much at the highest level they have in the last four years um, in our school. Um, by and large, our parents seem very pleased with the success that's happening in and around us. Uh, we are just trying to get to a place where we satisfy you, where you see your neighborhood school as a viable option. As a product of public schools, it's one of the things I most believe in. And while I support our division's um, mission and expectation that Albert Hill and all of our schools throughout the division become these places where anyone can come to, what I really rest firmly on is having a neighborhood school. And the reason that's important to me is because I remember my fondest memories were built on the fact that I lived a couple of blocks from my school. And when you have children who cannot go to their own neighborhood school and have to be bused all the way over here, you lose that sense of community. So all of our evening events, things like that, are hampered by the fact that our children live you don't have to ride two buses to get here or live all the way across the east side of town to get here. So while we are excited that they are here and we want to make certain that we do things that change their life outcomes, we really, really take pride in making certain, if nothing else, that this neighborhood school is a viable option for every resident of this museum district and those of you who are close within. So I just want you to know that we are working extremely hard on behalf of not only the children of Albert Hill, but the community, because I see the big picture. And I know great kids become great citizens. They buy homes here. They eventually shop here. And so therefore, it brings money back into the community. So we try to look at it from that longitudinal standpoint of how we can take our little kids and make them great residents of Richmond. So for us, this is not about here, this moment, and now. This is about a lifetime. And how do we create and grow kids that will give back? And so that's our aim. We don't have it right every day. We try hard. And I certainly don't mind being humble and saying I make mistakes all the time. I'm doing my best to figure it out each way. But we will continue to see continuous improvement.
present in our building in service to you all and all of you who live in this district. So you guys know, you can always reach me by email or call me or just drop by if you want to check in on something or if there's something that's not pleasing to you, I am always responsive. So just know I'm available to you. Right. Does anyone have any questions for me before I hustle off to Fox? All right, you guys enjoy your evening, okay? Thank you. All right, uh, we'll back up a little bit and now ask Lieutenant Smith and uh, our brave souls from the fire department. I will say just for a second that. Uh, Lieutenant Stith received the Museum District Association's 2015 Star Award last week for being just a general you know what. Very guy in the community, and uh, we congratulate him on that. And uh, he's going to go ahead and tell us what's going on in front of him. Yes, sir. And I appreciate the award and all, but uh, you guys helped me get it, by the way. So thanks and kudos all of you. Uh, basically, we're doing pretty good this year. Every year I set a goal as far as reducing violent crimes and property crimes, not just for this district, but uh, sector wide. Uh, last year, compared to this year, I can tell you that my violent crimes is up by a tick, but the tick is about a difference of four to five, thanks to the couple of bank robberies I had in a seven day span. But thankfully, the same suspect kept on the same clues <laughs> and paint on it, so they helped me out a lot. However, however, I haven't, we haven't identified them yet. I sent out the uh, uh, next door post with some pictures of the gentleman with his clothes on that he robbed both banks with. So if you recognize him, or if he's a handyman and he didn't realize it, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> but now, the driving issue has always been property crimes. It's always been a thorn in my side. But compared to next year, it's a, it's a difference of almost 90-something crimes. So we did pretty good in reducing that. I say we. Because can, we can't do it by ourselves. It's just a group effort. But as the holiday season goes forward, uh, just, just be vigilant. If you're ordering packages through UPS, if I was you and I'm at home, I wouldn't accept them. Ask them by, you know, sign for it by order. Because if you don't, I can guarantee you the larcenies are going to increase. They will. Along with the decimal of vehicles, if you leave stuff in your vehicles, we're getting a, we're a little better, a lot better. I think uh, uh, compared to last year, we're up about maybe four or five percent. We're getting better. We're making arrests. We just arrested a guy uh, 10 days ago. And what I can tell you, these guys come in all shapes and sizes, colors, don't matter. It's a crime of opportunity. And they take advantage of what you present to them, basically. But all in all, everything is well. The bank robbery su suspect is still at large, but we're working feverishly to try to figure out who he is, because we don't have a name on him yet. And the only issue with the property crimes is still testing on the vehicles. A lot of folks holler at me sometimes and say, I think he has an electronic device, whoever the suspects are. Well, the suspects are kids sometimes, sometimes they're the homeless, and sometimes they're other folks. Now, is, they, is there a chance of somebody utilizing an electronic device? I can't prove it. I'm not going to say it's not, but one way to overcome that is to keep all your valuables out of your car. To me, that's the best way to overcome it. Yes, um, everybody loves to shop, right? All right, so criminals are looking out and they're casing as well. So if you have a lot of bags, you go to a lot of stores, try not to, at the, at the shopping center, try to put your, your valuables in your trunk already. So when you go home, you're not a target. Um, lock your doors. Um, don't even as small as a car charger in your car can be a window breaking out from a criminal because they think that your iPad or something, your phone is attached to that device and it's worth them breaking your window for nothing. Um, just be vigilant. Um, the neighbor next door app is really good to communicate between the communities. Um, and if you need us, just call us. We'll be there for you. On our walkabout, mentioned a couple of ran into that had a break in, but they didn't report it, and how it affects the data in your department of resources. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the last walk we had, which was in the museum district, the command staff walk, 
couple uh, walk up and says, well, we had these crimes, but we didn't report it. Well, if you don't report it, I don't know if it's going on or not. So therefore, when I look and try to analyze what's going on in my sector, which is 20-some neighborhoods long, and it's a big area, when I look, when I look at the data, I try to figure out where my crimes are happening at. If you don't report it, it doesn't pop up in my system. And I can't analyze where I need to put my resources on. So even if it's trivial, if you call it in, it helps me in the long run where I deploy my folks at. It makes a difference in the long run. Because that, that crowd we didn't report might be that individual who's kicking my tail in Colonial Place or south of the river. You never know. So that, it comes in handy. You want to have any questions at this time? Or? Yes, ma'am. Have you had a chance to figure it out who the person or persons were uh, with the break in of my dad's car in, in the Glen Burnie neighborhood as well as the other things that were going on? Plus the uh, testimony vehicles? You want, see, I'm a straightforward and honest guy, right? That's one of the hottest crimes to, to catch somebody at unless I catch them in the act. You know, a lot of people say it was fingerprints. You know? A lot of people touch cars. But now nah, we haven't uh, got any leeway on that particular uh, case yet. And but I do, let me put it this way. A lot of times we pick up a suspect, like we did uh, a couple weeks ago, they will say, well, I broke into about four or five or six or seven cars. All right? They tell me all this, but unless we can go back and actually pull it, and marry it up with the area and the time and the date. I can't, we can't go to court and say, yeah, uh, Judge, you told us he broke into four or five, seven cops. You know, we have to still prove it. Because they're not going to help us out other than that. But just give me a call or email and I'll double check to make sure. I'm positive we have it. And there was no suspect in your particular one that I know of, so. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, speak up, Flipper. I don't like all the doors that I To be honest with you. The door didn't get the guy. No, ma'am, it's not. Thoughts, comments, we're going to the rest of the group. Sorry, what do you make? What do you want to get started? Well, I mean, is this a common occurrence that people are entering homes through the it's not a common occurrence, but it happens. It's just like breaking out of the window. They look at the uh, path of least resistance. I mean, the frequency of this? In this frequency is not often. It's not often. Well, can you clarify that? What does that mean? Like, is this once a week? Once a month? Once a month? Not often. I'll say maybe once a week. Yeah, once a week. Yeah, well, most of the time it's through a door, a window, a unlocked door. And as far as the door, see that quite often. It's not as bad as you may think it is. I'm just saying, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Just cut down on that particular uh, interest rate, so to speak. But the more you sell it by your house, the better. That's the way I would have it. Can I ask that? Um, yes, yeah, I haven't once had that happen, but not to say that it's not a big issue. Um, but one thing I would suggest, cameras, are vital. If you can secure your home with cameras, you can actually see someone going into that body door. Uh, we've had people that actually had called when they were in larceny in progress. And, you know, we can survey the area, catch the people, or kid. Because a kid can fit through the body door. You know, it's just by size. Um, some people just kick in the door. So you don't have to have a body door for your home that you're working into. But if you have cameras, That'll help you yeah. in the area, outside the home, on your street. So, I mean, if you got some more key probing questions, just give me a holler now. I'm going to go over your case a little bit and get my detective and give you some uh, proper tips. Right? Anybody else? All right, I think we're good. Uh, Battalion Chief Curry is going to 
speak on behalf of the fire department, let us know what's going on in the district and any other good safety tips that we can always remember. Chief. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Jeff Kirk, Italian Chief. I'm stationed out of Station 18 on Thompson Street. Just real quick, my battalion runs from VCU to University of Richmond, from the river all the way up to Zay Avenue, north side. So I feel like a broken record every time I come to one of these, but in this case, it's a good thing. Uh, fire activity in the museum district and the first district is very, very, very low, if non existent as far as active fires since the last time we met. Um, we're moving out of the heavy river activity season and the brush fire season. And as they say, it is tis the season. We're moving into what I call alternative heat source season. People's chimneys uh, have a use with the fireplace, or wood stove, and people using alternate heat sources like space heaters. The tips we'd like to leave with you is any heat source, at least leave three feet from that heat source to anything flammable. That doesn't matter what type of heat source it is. Um, the other thing is if you have a chimney of any kind used for your fireplace or a wood stove, please have it inspected every year and serviced as needed um, because we do run into a lot of chimney fires. Even when we don't have a fully blown structure fire, we do have to do some damage to a home that has a chimney fire because we have to access that chimney in what is normally a broken flue, which is easily detected with just a, an annual inspection. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Okay, I hope I can report the exact same thing next time. <laughs> All right, and on, on a somewhat sad note, this is our last town hall meeting with Glenn Sturdivant as school board member who just arrived. Welcome Glenn to uh, give us an update on schools. He's gonna stay on the job through early July or early January and uh, make sure the schools keep moving in the right direction. Glenn. Good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Glenn Sturdivant, your school board rep for this area, and I uh, just want to give you a couple of quick updates on uh, the school system. Um, uh, this past year, we had commissioned a facilities task force to look at all of the school properties and to see where um, we can uh, be better use our resources and better be, be better stewards of our schools um, so that we are not uh, continuing to operate chronically under-enrolled schools year after year, so that we are better able to make sure that ceiling tiles aren't falling in on, on kids' heads. Um, and so uh, the process that is going on now are uh, public meetings throughout the entire city um, for the administration to get feedback from the community, from you all, as to what you would like to see and uh, what you think uh, makes good sense for the school system. So there are two meetings coming up. Um, in this general area, one right here at Albert Hill Middle School on December 3rd at 6 p.m. So December 3rd at 6 p.m. right here at Albert Hill. You can come for one of those uh, community meetings. And then if you can't make that, there's another one on December 10th, and that is at Fox Elementary in the Fan, also at 6 p.m. So December 3rd here at Hill, December 6th, uh, December 10th at 6 p.m. at Fox Elementary. Uh, the other thing uh, that's going on right now uh, we um, just finished a leveling process in the city schools um, and so we had some schools that had classrooms with six or eight or ten kids and we had other schools with classrooms with 30 or 35 kids in them. And so we went through this leveling process where we reallocated uh, some teachers to help alleviate that overcrowding uh, and again to better utilize our resources where we had very small classes and that helped us save more than four million dollars uh, across the school system by doing that leveling process and also help kids who are in very overcrowded classrooms um, get uh, more one-on-one uh, -on -one attention. Uh, the third thing is a after the recession in 2007-2008, uh, like a lot of state employees and police officers and firefighters, Richmond City school teachers and teachers all across the state 
their salaries were level, like most of us in the private sector as well. Their salaries were kept level for a, a number of years. Um, and then in years after that, as the General Assembly or as localities, uh, the city allocated more money for raises. Um, that had the effect of, of raising everybody's salary, but teachers were not able to move up the step scales. And so that has resulted in this um, compression phenomenon where you have a teacher right out of college making the same amount of money as a teacher who's been teaching for nine years. Uh, and there were instances of that sort of uh, problem all throughout the pay scale. And it happens with firefighters, it happens with police officers uh, all, all, all across the state. So we, can, we uh, had a study by an outside firm come in and tell us how can we get this under control and work to fix it. And we just received that last night. So there are some promising ways to help dig out of that hole uh, and to, to better compensate our, our teachers and get them back on those step scales uh, in a way that's not going to break the bank and that will be fiscally responsible. Uh, so those are the, the big topics we have going right now. And uh, if anybody has any questions, we have to answer. Well, All right. What What's the process for yeah. filling the seat? I should mention. So uh, I, I will continue serving on the board until uh, January 13th. Um, we are going to issue a, a public notice um, to anyone who is interested in applying. The process will be that the next school board member will be selected by a majority of the board. And so the process will be in December or January, you can submit uh, a resume and a cover letter. Um, and then there will be an interview process and then a selection that will be made. So I'd be happy to talk with anybody offline who might be interested or you know of someone who might be good. We'd love to get uh, a lot of really qualified, energetic um, people who really care about this to, uh, to apply. Yes? Um, there, there's a lot of discussion when you did leveling the, the playing field, as you say, and I think it was a wonderful idea. And obviously you say it's are the parents happier and the teachers happier now that it has happened and everybody's settled in? But there, like any sort of change, there's always uh, some creaking in the joints. And um, I think by and large, uh, ideally going forward, this is not something that we should be doing in September or October. Um, and that's something that the administration has identified and we pointed out to them that that's not something we should be doing at that point in the school year. We need to be doing that over the summer. One of the challenges, uh, given the uh, population in Richmond City Schools, is um, in, in some schools we have a, a lot of kids will enroll the first week of school. And so it's very difficult to assess how many students are going to be there when school starts and therefore how many teachers you will need. And so part of that is yet it has to be done on the fly. Um, that being said, uh, I think that we can come up with some good estimates over the summer to be able to, to pre-plan for that so we don't have uh, those sort of changes going on this year. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Glenn. Got you. Not going to get away that quick, but uh, we, have, we have a parting gift for Glenn, who, as everybody knows, is moving on to the State Senate, and he's been a great uh, friend to the district and the city on school board. when. We both first got sworn in. We met at Panera for our first meeting and both sat down and realized that change was needed in public schools. And Glenn has done a great job of initiating that with a lot of the other new school board members. And uh, they formed a majority of really uh, dedicated people, make, willing to make the tough decisions, which aren't always easy. Uh, and Richmond has never done a very good job of so. Um, for Glenn's future wisdom at the state capitol, this is a book written by former delegate Barney Day called Notes from the Sausage Factory, <laughs> which is a, let's see, it's about 350, 380 pages of political tales told by people from Jeff Shapiro to Paul Goldman to governors like uh, Wilder, Rob, Gilmore, Allen, the old man's wow. even got a, he, he, the old man's even got a piece in here. Uh, so this is some, some wisdom for you as you move on up to the state senate. That's great. And uh, we thank you for everything you've yeah. done for the students. Thank you. Thank you. I, I still live a mile away. Well, it's, number one, it's been an honor representing this area on the city school board. And thank you for the opportunity to do it. 
uh, and also the opportunity to now represent this area in the state senate. I still live a mile down the road, so I hope you'll have me back. Uh, <laughs> Anytime you want to come. Thanks, Glenn. All righty, moving on. Um, we're going to scroll through this because we've got some special guests here, and I'm going to roll through this like Red Bull, so just hang on for the ride. Floyd Avenue, Bike Walk Street. Uh, construction began yesterday, actually wasn't construction, the crews were out analyzing, marking the uh, pipes and things like that, where the uh, curb cuts are going to be and so on. So uh, look for that if you're on Floyd Avenue. Uh, Dooley, Auburn, and Belmont are the three uh, intersections affected. And uh, it'll take about three months. I think the part in the museum district won't take that long because it's going all the way down to VCU. So uh, look for that. Leaf collection, we're doing one cycle this year. Starts the week of December 4th in the museum district. And the 11th through the end of the month, west of uh, 195, assuming there's no snow, which we hope there's not, uh, because the leaves are already falling pretty heavily. Uh, you know, I, I notice them around a lot. Traffic safety, this was sent in by a constituent uh, on Grove Avenue. Just a reminder, uh, especially if you're driving around areas where where you might have plenty of sight coming down Grove Avenue like this car did. This car was going too fast and there was a car that could not see, probably because there was a car blocking the vision. Uh, and you'll notice this car flipped over because the roof got smashed in. It's pretty ugly. Uh, nobody was seriously injured, but it's still scary and uh, shows what can happen if you're not paying attention or if you're driving too fast. So always keep that in mind. It's, it's a good reminder, especially after what happened on Floyd. Uh, earlier this year. Uh, I'm in Grove, out by Mary Munford. Financial reporting, uh, won't go too much into the CAFR uh, being late. We've talked about that. Ms. Cuffey Glenn is our special guest here tonight, and uh, we've, uh, we've talked about that. Um, one of the ordinances that we put in place uh, that I introduced and passed unanimously through council with Ms. Cuffey Glenn's help and Ms. Reed's help, who's the director of finance, uh, will allow this to be presented uh, online every month and it is an example that we found was this is something that they did in Suffolk where, where she was previously running the uh, the administration and then there are certain things like this is a site in Alexandria which is in my research I also found uh, was a model so you can see every month there will be statistics like this offense vacancy uh, multifamily construction all of the a, a lot of the things that go into the comprehensive annual financial report will be available for people to review uh, and and it will hopefully make sure that the uh, the CAFR is is on time and and I believe and I'm not just blowing smoke because she's sitting right here in front of me uh, that Miss Cuffey Glenn will make sure that that happens because she and Miss Reed mean business and so I think that's that's a positive. Some of the budget changes uh, that, that we talked to her office and the budget staff were some of the things that when, when we had a joint budget session to uh, about early October, mid-October, um, one of the things I noticed was in studying the Suffolk budget is that they do a lot of other things that make it easier for council and the public to understand exactly what a department's getting and why. And I'll show you an example. Uh, this is, I chose the fire department because it, it was a relatively simple budget page to look at it. It wasn't, wasn't too long like some of the departments, but this is a page in the Richmond budget, department overview, fiscal summary, uh, breakdown by service level, and program budgets. And then if you look at what Ms. Cuffey Glenn and Ms. Reed did in Suffolk, you notice accomplishments. Uh, it, I should have blown that up more, but there are accomplishments, objectives, and metrics just on the first page, which show calls for service. For instance, 11,372 calls for service in 14, projected in 15, 11,605, estimate of 16, 11,873. So, uh, number of EMS calls, fire casualties, average response time in minutes, it's 6.59 across the board. So those are the types of things that might seem micromanaging and boring, but they really help us figure out what departments need to succeed. 
and if they're if they're meeting their target. So, and this is another page. We get this page in the Richmond budget, but it comes in a separate um, it comes in a separate document. So it's kind of hard to to go back and forth. And granted, the Suffolk budget is is smaller, but it's still important for everybody, whether you're on council or whether you're just a member of the public, to understand. So. Uh, I, I think those changes uh, will be very helpful moving forward. Real quick, council raises. I did vote to support the study, which came back and said council members should be making 36,000 uh, roughly. Um, I have also made it clear that I'm not going to support anything that does not uh, that that takes effect before the 2020 election. I don't think it's fair for for incumbents to vote on themselves a raise while they're in the incumbent before the next election. That's just my personal opinion. Children's Hospital, that has been taken uh, off the table as of last week. Um, it's a political issue I won't get into in too much detail here, but um, we'll hear more about that shortly. The tax rate, we voted to keep it the same. Uh, there's a rollback clause in the state code uh, that we did not. Uh, we did not think we should roll it back to 117. It, it, it's kind of a. No offense, Glenn. It's kind of a thing that the state does that they they require localities if property values go up that you have to consider rolling back the tax rate. But if the state actually has extra revenue, they never consider rolling back anything that they do. So maybe that's something we can change at the state level. Uh, so a, a, as we know, money is tight. And um, for all of us, but you know, I think the committed commitment to investments in education and other areas are, are, are key at this point. Um, video didn't show up. I did this uh, over the edge for Special Olympics last month uh, for the second time and conquered my fear of heights for about 10 minutes. I'm still scared of heights, but raised $1,100 for Special Olympics. And thank you to everybody who uh, contributed. We had can't remember how many, there's 20, 20 some contributors that um, put in and we raised $1,100. All told, the uh, Special Olympics Virginia raised 90000 for all of the uh, people that went over the edge. And as you all know, the Special Olympics have their summer games every year at the University of Richmond in the district, which is a great event. Uh, Boulevard redevelopment, you'll be hearing a lot more about this in the next three weeks. Um, Mayor's going to introduce a plan that will propose the highest and best use, uh, which in my opinion seems to be predetermined, but we haven't seen the plan yet. And uh, it has an aggressive timeline for public comment and adoption and zoning. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out. Most of these big development projects usually have a slower timeline, uh, but this one does not. Uh, we'll see what the flying squirrels have to say. Uh, or, or how they are incorporated or not into the development. And um, they are a current tenant, so their needs really should be considered, but uh, we haven't seen that so far. Charles Samuels and I put in a paper for a request for qualifications to kind of cast a wide net to the develop, to develop the site. And that was rebuffed for quite some time, but now all of a sudden there's there's a, a quick, aggressive uh, plan for this site. So we'll see how it plays out. The next time this will be discussed is Thursday at the Finance Committee, so we'll learn more. So read the paper on Friday, and, uh, and we'll find out exactly more about this proposal that's coming forward. Uh, so any questions real quick before I turn it over to our two guests? Yes, ma'am. Well, does it, do you think it bodes well for the new redevelopment of our plans for the Fine Squirrels? I mean, do you get a good feeling that with the Children's Hospital not being put there at this point? Well, I, I'll, I'll say this. Um, I think casting a wide net to find creative solutions to development is, is key. Uh, and, and somebody mentioned last week that you know, the flying squirrels were considered a good use for mixed use development in Shaco Bottom. Why wouldn't they be considered a good mixed use for the boulevard? Um, you know, 
if you look at that picture, there's a lot of surface parking, but that's nothing that can't be solved with a parking net. Uh, and there was going to be a parking deck downtown. There, were, you know, the the mayor's plan and the Shaco ballpark plan from two years ago had seven parking decks holding 10,000 cars, which is way too much uh, for that site. So there were parking decks going on the boulevard anyway, and I. I I think it's a discussion to have, but options are good, and we just won't know much until the plan comes out, and we'll know more after Thursday, and then we'll know more after the, the plan is introduced, but I just wanted to put that on everybody's radar to pay attention, because it's going to be, it's important. I mean, it's very close to, to this area, and it has a huge potential to generate a lot of money for the city. It's just how much and what kind of, you know, you, some other people have mentioned that you know, the, the residential boom in Scott's Edition is, is, is killing. Tons of buildings are getting renovated. So you can't look at the boulevard and say, all right, we're going to do all residential. We're going to do apartments because it will, A, would saturate the market, and B, you don't know what the market demand is. But the, the advantage of that site is you can also go vertical because there's not a whole lot of residential neighborhoods. You know, there's Sherwood Park right across the interstate, but you, you, can get some, you can get some vertical density there without scaring the resident, uh, residential neighborhoods around it. Uh, so it, it's a matter to get to be played out. Any other questions about anything else that I just breezed through real quick? Yes, sir. Um, at one point in time, we sort of heard that the ballpark at the bottom was a dead issue, and I keep reading that that's absolutely not the case. Is, do you have any, anything you can comment on that? Well, to put a ballpark in the bottom is going to require somewhere between 12 and $14 million in infrastructure work. And right now, the capital improvement budget alone does not allow that kind of uh, infrastructure work unless the private developer wants to pay for it, which if they did, they would have done it already. They would have done it two years ago. Uh, but we don't, we don't have that de debt capacity. Our debt capacity for the next few years is very thin until we get some bonds paid off, and I believe it's in 20, 2020, fiscal year 2020, that it starts to uh, allow itself for more construction projects. And I may have gone by that. Yep. Anything else? Yes, sir. Um, I'm just wondering why it's so long, um, but instead of the whole part, Well, and, and that question I think will be taken up when we discuss the redevelopment of the boulevard. I mean, in, in my opinion, I don't think any option should be excluded. Uh, but I'm just one one voice out of nine, and uh, we will have that discussion starting on Thursday. But but you're right, and, and you make a lot of good points. Uh, so we I, I think we need to keep that keep that option open. Anything else? Is that yes, your wording, um, aggressive timeline? It is or? totally my word. Okay. <laughs> All right, without further ado, and I can take any other questions offline. Uh, my old, my, my former boss, he's not old. Um, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Olinger, Director of Planning and Development Reviews, uh, going to talk to us about the Airbnb. Uh, strategy that the city's undertaken. There, you know, this is uh, the, the the kind of new economy. It's kind of like Uber. Uh, Airbnb has opened up, and, and some places have uh, have put in some restrictions. For instance, uh, a lot of localities are making them pay the same hotel tax that the Marriott or the Hilton or the Omni pay. Uh, and he's going to go through a, a presentation for a few minutes before Miss Cuffy Glenn gets up and uh, and kind of talk to you about what the city strategy is and. Uh, and take your question, Mark. Okay. Thank you. Oh, wait. Yeah, where's your thing? It's I'll find it. Escape and bottom of the town. Thank you. Go. All right. My second Is that full screen?
Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. I will try to be relatively brief. I didn't realize it's been a while since I've been here and how comfortable these chairs are. Um, in, in June of this year, the Common Council adopted a resolution asking Depart oops. Yeah. asking Department of Planning and Development Review to take a look at amending our zoning ordinance to allow internet lodging services um, to occur. So, and that vote passed on a vote of eight to zero, and the result of that study was to come back with them with some changes to our zoning ordinances that would allow short-term rentals to occur. They said to do that as soon as practical, and part of the as soon as practical was to take a look at what other cities are doing, take a look at the state of the art in Richmond, which even though there's 300 listings, all of them are technically illegal, uh, and to come back with some recommendations. So what I'm gonna do tonight is, uh, is talk a little, give a quick presentation that I gave to the Planning Commission on October 19th and shared with the council about kind of where we are on the study right now and if I get through it quickly, entertain a few questions from you all. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about where we are in the city of Richmond. So I'm assuming everybody sort of knows what short-term rentals are, Airbnb, Verbo, HomeAway, stays can be hosted or unhosted. 56% uh, of the listings in Richmond are unhosted. That means nobody's in the unit when the person is staying there. Whole houses, private rooms, shared rooms are all possible during UCI. We had somebody wanting to rent out their backyard for campsites. So it can be any number of things as it relates to rentals. We actually contacted that person, said camping in the city is illegal, please stop, and they did. Um, this is, for those of you who might know, we just wanted to show for people who didn't, this is one of the city of Richmond um, um, sites, $150 a night, somewhere either in the fan or in this neighborhood. Um, Current operations, it's a very fluid and dynamic business, short-term rentals. So when we started looking at this in June, there were 434 listings. By the time we got to just before the bicycle race, there were almost 800 listings. And shortly after the bicycle race, we went down to 300 listings. The challenge with Airbnb and all of the short-term rentals as we come through some of the numbers I will present tonight, is that it's hard to get data from any of those services. I can't tell you exactly where properties are, but if you look at a front door and say 2205, that might give you a sense about where it is. The historic plaque probably also helps. But I don't know where they're located in general. Uh, I don't know how many people have stayed there in general. So we have to use a lot of dummy variables. So we use listings as kind of giving us a sense of the demand or the supply in an area. And in a minute I'll show you some statistics on uh, reviews which we use to look at demand in the area. So the more reviews our operating assumption is the more stays. So it's a dynamic industry and it's been very dynamic in the city, certainly building up to the race and being relatively stable since the race at about 300 listings. I looked again tonight, that's about the number that's listed right now. 3,600 reviews in Richmond. Not every place who is listed has a review. So 5% of the listings are 50% of the rent, of the reviews. So. A very small percentage of the listings account for a very large percentage of the reviews. Average is eight, median obviously is one because 50% have not had one review on their project. So while we say we may have 300 listings in the city as of today, it's entirely probable that 150 or more of those have nobody staying in them or have had nobody staying in them. The six most popular areas are the Fan, Woodland Heights, Forest Hill, Museum District, Churchill, Downtown, and Carytown. About 50% of all listings, over 60% of all reviews. And to show you how UCI affected the Airbnb, I did get one stat from Airbnb. And that stat was during the course of the race, the stays in Airbnb units was 400% greater 400% above the previous two months. So Airbnb and the other internet lodging or short-term rental services were well used in the city of Richmond. 
One last thing, there are multiple listing services. Like I said, there's Verbo, there's HomeAway, there's Airbnb. I saw another one mentioned the other day. I keep using Airbnb because they are the 800 pound gorilla. Every other, when we did our original study back in June, everybody on all the other listing services were all on Airbnb. So when you look at the Airbnb numbers, you get about as close to 100% of all that's out there as possible. Again, this just shows you 1.4% of the listings are over 20%. So we've got some uses in this city right now that are functioning almost as small hotels. Just a quick show of hands. Anybody here think they have a neighbor who has an Airbnb unit near them? Fascinating. One of the challenges we've had, or one of the things that I find fascinating about this entire discussion is the amount of complaints or lack of complaints that we have had over the last year in this, about a dozen. That's where they're located. You can see the cluster. You can see also where the clustering occurs on the right in the red, where you have 12 or more reviews. Again, it tends to be this neighborhood, the fan in downtown. Um, there is an inf existing enforcement mechanism. Like I said, we've gotten less than a dozen, but it's the typical complaint. Somebody calls a complaint in, we investigate. If we find it, we write them a notice of violation, give them 30 days to uh, fix it, and if they don't, we can prosecute and summons and issue summons. Um, it's a class one misdemeanor, so there are some penalties attached to it. Again, I've received, not I, the zoning administrator has received less than a dozen in the last year. So that's kind of the state of the city. We have them in town. They're all around us, probably. I got one behind me. I live in Tobacco Row. I know of at least one in the Lucky Strike building because I see it advertised. Um, they generally tended to be good neighbors because uh, we don't get a lot of complaints, although we have gotten some. So the idea then was that's the state of existing, what's happening in other communities. We rarely looked at seven other communities, and I'm not going to go through every list and, and bore you with the details. I've got a little sheet in the back that gives you a link to, if you want to, go home and take a look at the Planning Commission agenda for October 19th. But we looked at seven cities generally in the region or similarly situated to the city of Richmond and really looked at them across five major categories. That is, were they permitted as a principal or accessory use in the districts within which they were permitted? Were unhosted stays permitted? That is one of the biggest questions I get in this entire discussion of short-term rentals is about people renting out their unit for a very long period of time over the course of the year and not actually being there. What's the maximum number of night and occupants permitting and public safety? Those seem to be the kind of questions that come up time and time again. And as we look at kind of crafting an ordinance for the city of Richmond, if I could just kind of walk through these five real quick as we go through and um, just tell you a little bit about how I, I think I see this evolving, and then we'd like to get some comments from you later. There's not one city we've, ex we've looked at that allows short-term rentals as a principal use on a lot anywhere in the community. So they're all viewed as accessory uses. Well, if there are accessory uses, that means that use has to be, there's gotta be a principal use somewhere on that parcel. And that usually gets to the point of hosted stays that somebody needs to live in that unit the majority of the year. The second one is unhosted stays. Every city we've looked at, with the exception of Roanoke, permits unhosted stays. Now, the number of days in the course of a year that that can be done prior to coming to uh, Richmond, I was in Madison, Wisconsin. Madison passed theirs a couple years ago. They provide up to 30 days a year unhosted. After that, you can rent your unit out the other 335 days a year as long as you're in the unit. Charlottesville, which passed theirs in, October, in late September, early October, allows you to do unhosted stays, but there's got to be somebody on call so that if something happens, there is somebody nearby who can address your concerns. 
The maximum number, this is where I think we're going to spend a lot of time over the next few months, the maximum number of occupants and the maximum number of nights is all over the map. Uh, and I don't have an easy answer for you tonight. I'd be interested if anybody has questions, but it's, it's very so dramatically city by city, I can't draw a thread. Usually it's tied to maximum amount of occupancy of the building, maybe family definitions, num two people per sleeping room. You name it, there's probably somebody who's looking at it. But there is that, and we will certainly look at that. Permitting, every city has some level of permitting to track the use of the short-term rentals. Our thinking is we will have everybody have a guest register if the ordinance gets adopted so that we can at least track how many nights are being, are being used over the course of a year to help provide some opportunity to see about the collection of taxes and, and lodging taxes, which I'll get to later. Um, and just to be able to say that use is permitted at that address and then to provide, if people aren't being team players, a method to retract that permit so that, that can't, they cannot act as a host for a while. So permitting is both a, a knowledge function and a regulatory function. And then public safety, smoke, fire detectors, all of that. Every city is kind of going in that direction. We will certainly look at that. These are other cities, uh, Nashville, Philly, Louisville, and Charlottesville. You can be taxed. The challenge with taxation without there being some legislation either, either collected by the short-term rental folks or somebody through the state is a very spotty record. I got a comment from somewhere in Dallas. There's about 700 hosts or 800 hosts or some number like that in Dallas. They had two people paying taxes. <laughs> And without a mechanism, so one of the questions that comes up is not only can we get some lodging taxes, but we can get some other taxes. And the challenge is without a robust collection, a robust collection mechanism, it becomes a real challenge. We can ask for business licenses, but until you do a certain level of volume of business, you don't pay for it. It's not really a large generator of revenue. Our guess is $80 a night or $130, we'd see somewhere between a couple of thousand dollars off of each of those rooms. Building code requirements are not a big issue. There are changes in multifamily that might require some changes. The guy at Lucky Strike behind me may not be telling his landlord for a city that he's investing in short-term rentals and there may be lease issues. I've gotten a lot of comments about condominium buildings. That's an issue. Um, that's also a condo dock issue. So there, there may be some building code issues there on a case-by-case -case basis. We've checked with fire. Most of the issues that relate to occupancy cover it, whether it's a short-term rental or another occupied uh, dock, uh, structure, and if there is some building code issues, they'll look at that, but it doesn't seem to be a big issue. Enforcement will be the issue. How many days, how do we ease, make it easy to track enforcement? How do, we how do we provide penalties for people who don't follow the rules? It will be paperwork intensive. And in fact, when we made the presentation, the newspaper the next day said, two more people need, three more people need to be hired for short-term rentals. The point I was trying to make in the discussion and in the report is we have functions at the city right now that are very paperwork intense. And I can tell you, if, some, if, the, if we were to get 300 hosts, everybody signed up, or we were to get 400 hosts or whatever, that's a full-time equivalent in both finance and zoning to manage that process. If we get 15 or 20, it's a different game. Uh, next steps. Um, I presented this on October 19th. Over the next 45 to 60 days, I'm going to make a stop at every council district in the city to talk about this as I'm doing with you all tonight. You're first, by the way. Uh, we're also going to talk to hoteliers and other members of the hospitality lodging industry. We're trying to set that up right now. We are trying to work with Airbnb to get a list of their hosts so we can talk to the hosts 
to see what their issues are as it relates to short-term rentals in Richmond. We'll put all of that together, begin drafting the outline of a proposed ordinance. We've got to define what a short-term rental is, number one. And then we will begin in early 2016 revisiting these issues with the Planning Commission, hopefully for something to come back to Council in late spring so that if an ordinance is passed, we will be in a position to have it available when the vacation season starts this summer. This is a link, one of those awful long links to a document. Uh, and I put that in the back. There's a little piece of paper on it. This is the city, is the planning commission, and others are going to a Legistar system. So everything we do on our agendas are now online as PDF. That's the link to the agenda for the, October 19th. It'll show not only the preliminary report, but some other items, this PowerPoint and a couple other items. I'm Mark Olinger. If you want to contact me and you've got questions, feel free to ship them to either John and he'll get them to me or me directly. Um, like I said, I've gotten already two or three about condominium buildings. They present an interesting challenge to us. Uh, I think they present an interesting challenge to all the communities given the character of the building. So I'm not unsympathetic to the questions that condominium owners have. Um, that's a whirlwind tour of short-term rentals in the city of Richmond. So I'd be happy to entertain any questions or comments that anybody might have right now. Yes, ma'am. Are there any maybe missing something here? So how much effort is it taking to do all these studies and to understand the enforcement that you want to put in place and the legislation that you want to put in place? And it seems like we can't tax it and we can't really enforce it. So once we put something in place, what does that even mean for the city? That's a great question. And the question, if you didn't hear the question, is why are we going through all of this if we really can't enforce things and we really can't tax? My standard answer is that innovation outpaces regulation at every turn. So we're always playing catch up. So I, I, would, I would say that as it sits right now, yes, there are challenges. And I think every city in America or throughout the world that has identified short-term rentals as an issue is it's also brand new. It's, it's the shiny item. I think that will change over time as the industry matures. So I think one of the things we want to do is we don't want to make the barriers. So let's, let me just back up a minute and just say this. Let's assume, as the council resolution says, we're interested in encouraging but understanding the market for short-term rentals. If I know where they are and we get complaints or there are issues or other things, then we can manage that. I think the question when I asked is, there's 300 of them in the city and two of the largest areas for them are in this neighborhood, yet nobody here raised their hands saying they think they have an Airbnb near them. Um, means that maybe most of the people are being relatively considerate, but there may be bad actors. And one of the big issues in Austin, which is fighting this tooth and nail because they don't believe there's enough enforcement capability, is what happens with the unhosted stay, which are basically turning into party houses. So I think we need to be able to at least identify where people are, make sure there's some level of safety and security to the, to the site, uh, work at either the state level or at the provider level about collecting the taxes. I believe, left to their own devices, Airbnb says they send out 1099s to everybody. That doesn't mean everybody's paying their taxes or reporting the income. So I think there needs to be another level of reporting and Airbnb and other communities is actually picking up the lodging taxes. So. I think we're in the I think we're on the you know the front of a wave and we need to understand what's going on. So I would say that if, as long as we know where they are, as long as we understand that those are that are being good actors are being good actors, those that aren't, we can come down on and we figure out the taxing ability which they can be taxed. I think over time we can do this where it will be a decent proposition. 
The industry will mature. I think at some point all of these issues regarding insurance and taxation and safety and all of those will, will happen. We're just a little ahead of that for the early adopters and I think something will happen. So I, I wouldn't say that it's a lost cause. I think we're just early in the process. We need to figure out how to get in front of it to the extent we can and let others help us get to where we need to be long term. Let me interrupt. If, if anybody has any other questions, Mark will be here at the end. I appreciate him coming. Um, just as an example, I, I sent him an, an article that I read in the Wall Street Journal a couple months ago that talked about uh, everybody's thinking about Paris these days. And Paris, I think, five years ago had, was it 4,000 tourist apartments for rent? Not all of them were Airbnb. Uh, now they have 40,000 uh, just in five years. So it, it is something that is growing and, and Cities all over the world are dealing with it. It's just a question of, of how do we address it. But I want to thank Mark for coming. I want to uh, take the rest of our time for, for Ms. Cuffey Glenn. But thanks for well, appreciate it. Uh, Mark will be around, and you can email myself or Eli for the uh, uh, the information that, that Mark displayed. Um, and now I'm going to take a quick moment to introduce Ms. Cuffey Glenn, who's the Chief Administrative Officer for the city, uh, which means she runs the place. Um, and we're lucky to have her. She is, uh, came, she's former planning, Deputy Director of yes. uh, the Planning Department, where I used to work, and she went to Suffolk, and she returned in May, and she is uh, really doing a good job of trying to change attitudes across departments and, and get people to think differently and work differently and independent, think independently uh, to get problems done. One of her mottos, which uh, I'm so glad to hear, is that she doesn't want a crew going back to a job uh, a second time, get it right the first time. And, and I've seen an improvement in the request that Eli and I put forward uh, to get addressed, and I, I think that's starting to take shape across the city. Uh, and so. I'm going to turn it over to her for some of her remarks and her uh, attitude, which I think you'll find refreshing uh, and, and positive for the future of the city. And then she'll take questions and uh, close out the meeting. So, Ms. Cuffey Guns, please welcome. Thank you. Well, it's certainly good to be here. Um, I always tell everyone I started my career here about 30 years ago. Uh, I came from the University of Virginia School of Architecture. Uh, my background is in planning. Uh, and I always wanted to be in Richmond. Uh, I remember when I would uh, take the bus station um, stop here in, uh, in Richmond, coming from UVA, and I would see City Hall. And I was like, I really wanted to work there, not really knowing what was going on in the building, but just wanted to be a part of this environment. Uh, so for me, I believe that there is a role that government plays in the lives of our citizens, and I always want it to be a positive experience. Um, starting 30 years ago in the planning department, as Mr. Glaus indicated, I was a planner. Started as a senior planner and just matriculated and became deputy director for the planning department. Uh, and then um, 16 years of working in the city hall. And then five years I went to the housing authority, so I had an opportunity to not only deal with the planning piece, but also implementation uh, as it relates to what needs to happen in our community and how can we be inclusive as it relates to government and the role we play in the lives of people. I, I see some friends in the audience, and Zoe and Green, uh, she's certainly been a dear friend over the years. Uh, one of the things that I was responsible for when I was a part of the uh, city government uh, 30 years ago is creating what we call the neighborhood teams process. And some of you have probably heard about it. Because I really believe there has to be a partnership between what we do as practitioners, also the inclusiveness of the stakeholders, citizens, businesses, uh, every day. Uh, what you all do in this community. Because the goal is to make this a better place uh, for our citizens, our businesses, our families. And I think that should certainly be the hard work that we try to reach as a, as a community. I went to Suffolk. Uh, I was their city manager for about eight years. I really spent 10 years uh, in uh, the city of Suffolk. Uh, in 60 days after becoming city manager, there was a tornado that fell out of the sky. Um, and for me, learning how to work and navigate difficult situations is something I take a lot of pride in because I always believe uh, that you can accomplish anything you believe in your own mind when you create a team. So after 60 uh, days of being their city manager, a tornado fell out of the sky. A year later, we lost about 2,100 jobs. 
uh, because the Department of Defense decided to disestablish one of their facilities. Uh, then the next year, uh, the market tanked badly throughout the country. So I'm used to adversities, but I'm used to also making a difference. And one of the things Mr. Balaz and I really talk about every time he and I meet is that we need to get things across the finish line. Uh, but in order to do that, it really takes cultivating the strong partnerships with competencies in the organization. Uh, there are a couple of things that I'm focusing on now as a CAO for the city. And most of you probably heard about our financial situation, trying to get the cap done for 2014, 2015, and getting ourselves ready for 2016. As you all know, within three months of me bringing Lenore Reed on board, uh, she was my finance director in the city of Suffolk. Uh, we were able to get it done in less than three months, but it took a, a lot of time, a lot of energy, and really just trying to create the structure that I think are critical for any government organization. <coughs> so I'm just to interrupt, excuse me, couple people just wanted to give you to turn up the volume. Just oh, okay, no. Well, let me know how low or high I need to go, okay? Um, get into it. Um, I think what you all have heard as it relates to the city financial situation is. Uh, it deals with our financial reporting and how we need to be accurate and timely in what is required by the state. Uh, we just finished 2014. Uh, it had been delayed for almost an entire year. And when Lenore Reed came on board in July 1 of this year, uh, that was the primary focus. How can we ensure that our financial state is there? Because I think with anything that you do, whether it's private business or government, you need to make sure your financial house is in order. And for me, that's really been a priority, and that's why 2014 has been done. And currently, we're working to get 2015 done in the course 2016. Uh, the other thing that's important for me uh, as the CAO is how do we ensure that we are a competitive city? Uh, we all talk about what a tier one community is, but for me, it's really being competitive because we don't just compete against what's happening in this country we're competing against the world. And so we need to make certain that we have the infrastructure in place, the land uses that are appropriate, and also the talent and skill when we're trying to recruit jobs to come into your community. So I think, secondly, is to make certain that we are competitive. And thirdly, I think it's important for us to cultivate the relationships that will be important for us to sustain uh, our city, uh, whether it's growing, looking at the population, but also as we make critical decisions about economic opportunities uh, and also creating the infrastructure that's going to be critical for us. Uh, when I was in the city of Suffolk, one of the things that we did, we really knew how to guide the development based upon the infrastructure uh, investment that you made. Because you can't do everything or be everything to everyone. So I think you have to be strategic in those decisions that you make. Uh, in the last piece I'll talk a bit about before I open up, question is, how do we ensure that as a community, especially when we're looking at the number of facilities that we need to bring online, especially schools and some of the other things that I think uh, we do know are priorities, how do you do it strategically, looking at the limited resources that you have? Because you can't burden uh, the citizens uh, when you're looking at your tax base. So how do you look for your efficiencies? How do you make those policy decisions that will ensure that you're making the best uh, plans for your community, not just five years out, but 15 and 20 years out. So you're going to have to make some tough decisions. And those are the things I believe that you do as a good manager, but you do it certainly by listening to the voices of our citizens, being inclusive in the processes, but also ensuring that you have the competencies when it comes to day-to-day -day operation uh, of your government. I believe, I believe that government has a role to play, but we want to make certain that we're doing it in the right and those are the things that really guide me as a professional. Um, I think I have the skills to make anything happen, but I can't do it alone. Uh, it's going to require all of us working in, in, in conjunction with each other, but also ensuring that we have the competencies within the organization uh, and looking for efficiencies uh, when you're trying to orchestrate and implement the plans that we have. So with that said, uh, just a little bit about me. I, I believe in this city. I really do. That's why I came back. Uh, I got a question from one of my friends when I first made the decision, the decision to come uh, back to Richmond. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about Suffolk and when I got there and became city manager. We have been downgraded by the bond rating agencies, negative bond ratings. Um, and as I indicated, 
the economy tanked. So it was a bad place. But when I left, we are now the city of Suffolk. Uh, we are triple A rated by two of the bond rating agencies from New York City. So that tells you it takes a lot of heavy lifting. Things don't happen overnight. There has to be the tenacity and belief that you can get things done. Uh, but we have to cultivate, I think, the appropriate partnerships. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to just open it up for questions that you have for me and uh, certainly try to respond. But it's great being back home. Uh, and my daughter, who was little when we left, she loves it that we're back now uh, in this city. He's a reporter, so I'm going to get He's already gotten my business card, and I told him to call me, so I mean, this time is for you. Yes, ma'am. What are some of the priorities that you see that we need to be working towards? Um, well, certainly, uh, I think, uh, um, and we play a role in the government, is the education, especially when it comes to how we need to be more prudent in the use of our resources. Uh, there's going to be a presentation at the land use. There's a committee, finance and administration on Thursday. Um, there's a committee of city council, and we're going to be making a presentation uh, about debt capacity. Uh, and it's where we need to be as a city. Uh, I think I mentioned a bit about the year 2020. Uh, when you look at the continuum of where the city is today, and the need for more facilities to come online, especially as it relates to schools, public safety, et cetera. How do we determine when the appropriate time for that? So when you look at where we are as a community, looking at we've just built four new schools and we've built a justice center, so you're talking over $200 million of debt just for those facilities. So where do we go down the road knowing that we still need to deal with schools, we need to bring on other facilities, and we do it strategically that we're not putting a lot of burden on you as a taxpayer. So how can we be strategic in making certain that we can meet those obligations, but it's done in a timely way? And working closely with our financial advisors, they've been able to lay out a plan for us that in 2020 you'll have the ability to do more. So how do you plan for the next five years when your debt capacity is almost at this limit? So the education is going to be critical for us to explain to the public that we can't do everything overnight. Perhaps there needs to be a pause when it comes to issuing debt uh, so that we are strategic and we're not going to the taxpayer and say, we want to raise taxes for it to happen. Perhaps we need to pause, look at a strategic plan for ourselves, and bring on those facilities in a timely fashion when it's affordable to us as a community. So that's really a priority for me. How do we get that education out, that information out? So collectively, we can make prudent decisions when it comes to how much debt we can entertain and when should we push the lever and say, green light, go. Um, we're just going to have to work through that education piece, but it also work with the city council and ensure that they have the best information to make informed decisions, as well as the staff. So that is critical for me and how we get that information out working collectively with the public. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, like, one of the, the big issues, certainly in the first district, I imagine citywide, is um, the maintenance of public spaces, um, including cutting grass with any kind of frequency. Um, I know last year, Gravity Oak Grove Avenue, there were weeds three feet tall in the median coming out of the cracks. And so that just makes the city look terrible and just pulls everybody down. So, I was wondering what your perspective is on. There are a couple of thoughts I have because I really believe that your city should be clean and safe. So how you see it tells you a little bit about your perception of yourself. Uh, one of the things I'm doing with my staff and Mark attests to that uh, since I've been on board, and it's going on six months now, so I can't say I'm new, uh, but I'm learning a little bit about our processes internally, how we make decisions as it relates to the deployment of resources, both manpower and dollar-wise. Uh, so some of the things that we're trying to really look at is the processes on how we entertain the assessments when it comes to cutting the grass and public property now. And I know private property, there's a whole different um, uh, story out there, but how do we maintain what we have? Because I really believe if you're bringing on facilities or if you're uh, doing anything in the public right away, 
you need to make certain that you can support that facility or you can maintain uh, where, whether it's the, the grass cutting or the paving, etc. So. But that's part of that long-term planning that has to be part of the equation. So you're not bringing on facilities and then you don't have the manpower to maintain those facilities or cut the grass. We're looking at some different ways of handling bulk. Uh, in Suffolk, I created a program whereby we actually designate a day along with sanitation pickup for bulk pickup so that you're not telling your staffers Monday, Monday you go to pick up the bulk, then you go on Tuesday, Thursdays. And so you're putting out a lot of uh, energy when it comes to fuel costs, manpower costs. So how can we be a bit more strategic in how we implement service delivery? So we're trying to really take a look at how we're doing business and hopefully enforce some of the changes that I think can work for us as a community. It's not that we don't want to respond. I think we should. We should be timely in our response. But we should be efficient in our responses. And so we're taking a look at service delivery. Uh, and we're taking a hard look. But I'm including the staff. They're part of the conversation. So it's not just coming from me telling the staff what to do. They're part of the conversation. So hopefully when we create uh, the implementation of some of the new processes to handle and respond to vegetation overgrowth, trash pickup, all those things that I've heard you tell me uh, again and again, you need to get out there and do more. So we're trying to look at some of those internal processes that make certain they're working for you. And they're being timely, they're being efficient, and also they're being affordable to you as a community. Yes, sir. There was a bond, bond issue this today by the city, so I guess you're saying that has used up the capacity for 2020 yes. after this one. Yes, started. that's done. Okay, and do you see any more deals being done like the one that was included today where it's the city's credit for a private business? You, you know, I think you're trying to refer to the stone yeah. area, you know, because that was something uh, that the council approved about a year ago. Uh, there are two train of thoughts I have uh, as it relates to uh, how we work with the private sector. Certainly, I think you are being prudent, uh, and you are, are being inclusive as well as this discussion with the council. Any project uh, that's going to be an opportunity. Uh, one of the things I've been educated on, one of the financial advisors for the city. In fact, the reason why it was supported by our financial advisors is because um, the payback comes from their leasing of the facility. And that's how it was, I think, presented to the city council. Uh, so with a private deal and there is a source of it coming from the citizens, I think that makes better sense because otherwise it's your tax dollars paying off that debt. And with the debt with Stone Brewery, it's coming from your lease payments which make it a bit more unique. So that's the thought I have when it comes to the private-public uh, partnership. If there are deals that allow the private sector to cover the debt service, not the taxpayer dollars, I think those are things that we should explore, but we certainly should make sure they are sustainable as well. So you have to do your due diligence when you're making those decisions. Yes, sir. Is the city able to make use of volunteers to leverage the employee workforce? Yes. My uh, wife and I have uh, volunteered for James River uh, Association to clean up some Cary Street and clean up some parks and so forth. But it seems to me that the city could do that a lot more directly and get a lot of stuff done on a volunteer basis. Sure. I, well, I believe in volunteers. I've, I've not come up to speed on why we're not being as aggressive as we can be, but that is certainly something I'll take a look at. Because I don't think we can do it alone, government. Uh, we need our citizens to be part of the solutions. Uh, there's just so many things that we have on that table uh, that we have to address. And if we can cultivate the strong partnerships uh, with you and your wife and others in the community, I think we ought to make it happen. Yes, sir. Well, as an example of volunteerism in the museum district we've had alley cleanup twice a year where the city's provided trucks and people have volunteered on Saturday morning to go down and clean up the alleys and this year for the fall cleanup uh, we got no trucks so we had no alley cleanup so even though there were volunteers ready and willing to pick up trash uh, the city 
uh, reneged on its deal to provide sure. the trucks. And that gets back to, as Ms. Green indicated, her question about the vegetation and what we're doing differently. Uh, my coming in is trying to really understand why and how those decisions were made. I heard some of it is because of the budget and what was adopted or not. Uh, but for me, I, I can't change what happened. Sure. My goal is to go forward and find out how we can really find solutions working closely with the public. And that is my goal and that is my commitment. Well, I think there's the volunteers there who are willing to do oh, yeah, some I, of the I, heavy lifting. Yeah, one, of, uh, one of the things I did uh, 30 years ago when I was here, I was part of creating the programs for volunteers and as it relates to neighborhood cleans, uh, cleanups and val uh, alley cleanup. I actually did it uh, for about 16 years, so I know exactly what you're saying, and I know the value of that contribution. I really do. We're going to get to the citizens, then we'll get, get to this gentleman here. <laughs> I want to make sure... I want to make sure we do that, and then we'll certainly get to you. Any other questions for the citizens in the room? Okay, let's see what the reporter has to say. Um, <laughs> did you have any comment on how the city got into its financial problems? And can you comment they, about... They, can, they want to hear you. Um, the question I have is um, how the city got into its financial problems and its late reporting, and what you specifically are doing to remedy that. Let me respond by saying, you know, I can't speak once again for what happened, but I know with the skills I have, uh, my goal is to make certain that we meet the requirements of the law as it relates to the state. They're very clear about certain requirements when it comes to financial reporting, and my commitment both to the mayor and the city council is to make certain we do those things to the best of our ability. Uh, coming into an environment where decisions and things already happen, it, it's hard for you to change uh, um, um, what happened in the past, but I think you can build a plan uh, going forward. That's one reason why Lenore Reed is here from the, uh, um, the city of Suffolk. She comes with a CPA. She's worked in private sector as well as public sector. A lot of skills that I think will be critical for us as we traverse some of the difficulties that we have in the city. Uh, so there's a strong commitment. And then one of the other things I really believe in is, is competencies and staff. I think sometimes you've got to look at an organization and deal with the reality. Because if the skills are not there, it's my job to make sure they become part of the organization. If, if change needs to happen, it needs to be inevitable, and you make those decisive decisions. And I think for me, those are the things I bring to the table from my 30 years of being in this profession of, of government service. Let me, let me just close on this note uh, real quick, and Peter, we can talk offline afterwards. Uh, because Ms. Cuffey Glenn has only been here since May, uh, but Marcus Jones was the previous uh, director of finance, and he went in 2010, I believe, to become the city manager of Norfolk. Um, and all I'll say is this, uh, between the time that Mr. Jones left and by the time Ms. Reed got here, Ms. Cuffey Glenn hired Ms. Reed in Jul July. Yes, July 1. So she, Ms. Reed came in in July. In that interim, we had multiple finance directors, and the department uh, was, let's just say, underperforming. Um, and it, it became, the, the problems occurred during that stretch. And you can read into that whatever you want. But uh, Ms. Cuffey Glenn and Ms. Reed are dedicated to fixing this. The, the ordinance that I mentioned earlier about reporting and being as transparent as possible about the city's financial condition every month. Um, they didn't, a, a year ago, if I would brought that up, it would have been fought tooth and nail. I sat down at the table with Ms. Graziano, Ms. Cuffey Glenn, and Ms. Reed, and they said, we just need a couple of minor amendments, and we're happy to start reporting every month. And, and that will make sure that the CAFR doesn't go disappearing for 10 months like it did, uh, you know, and, and, and the year before it was, it was four months late. And then last year was 10 months, or, or this past year. So uh, I, I think I think the, the answer is is sometime between when Marcus left and when Ms. Reed came on is, is what happened with the finance department. Uh, and unfortunately, the administration let it go on too long. That's another issue I, I won't get into today. But uh, I'm confident in Ms. Cuffey Glenn and Ms. Reed's leadership to turn it around. But it will take some time. Uh, it, it, it didn't get destroyed overnight. It's not going to re be rebuilt overnight. So, um, yes, ma'am. Hmm? 
cut you off? No, um, I just want to say, um, I've known Miss Cuffy Glenn for 20 years maybe, a long, long time, back when I was starting out in the museum district and she was in community development um, back in the neighborhood teams process, which um, we're both fond of, so <laughs> we'll see where that goes. Um, but I've never had such a big smile on my face as when she we heard that she was coming back to the city because, um, and I mean this honestly, she, Selena, you were one of the most dedicated, hardworking, honest, inclusive people that I've had the pleasure of, of working with, and, and I've never. The citizen, you will feel so different under with having Selena with the city because she makes you feel part of the, the, the family that we all love in Richmond. So I just wanted to say that. I could nice. possibly end this meeting on a better note. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for everybody for coming out. Thanks to Ms. Cuffey, Glenn, Mr. Olinger, all the public safety, and Glenn. Thank you for speaking. Thank you. We'll be around for questions. John, can I make a brief announcement? Sure. I apologize for getting here late. My name is Lynn Ivey, and I'm on a, a city committee, the uh, Aging and Disabilities Advisory Board. We're just attending district meetings and letting people know that we are, we're around. We were set up to look for issues that relate to aging and disability, mobility, that type of thing in the city, and anybody who's interested in learning more about what we're doing or have, has some uh, questions or comments about city facilities or anything within the city limits, please, you can talk to me or I can give you an email address or, or a, a telephone number. Can thank you, you. Can you send your info to Eli? And I will, yeah. I talked a little earlier this year, but, but thank you very much. That's it. Thank you. Linda. Hey, Eli.